listen to the Neil Lumpty Show. My name's Joey, and I'm joined by Paul. Good evening, mate. And Neil. All right. Uh, normally, I make some sort of um, fillery type comment at this point about what happened on Saturday while I try and get my bearings, but I'm going to dispense with tradition uh, and not do that and not go straight into the moments of the week. Just to say a quick thank you to everyone who has voted for us uh, in the Football Blogging Awards. We're absolutely delighted to say that today we found out that we are uh, in the finalists for the podcast. Indeed. Yeah, which we're really, really over the moon about. And that's down to all the votes that you've given us. Really, really appreciate it. Now, the, this will be the final round of voting. If you voted already, uh, you can vote again. And we'd really appreciate it if you did. If you head over to our Twitter page, it's at Neil Empty Show. And you can find details out there of how to do it. We've made it really, really easy. Just head over there. Uh, it should take you a couple of seconds to do. But firstly, like I say, thank you very much for, for doing that. And Because sec- we're totally delighted. And secondly... Um, yeah do it again basically (laughs) (laughs) we we kind of thought that was it done but uh, apparently not but there you go on to more pressing matters Uh, we won a real football match 3-0 at home against uh, Shrewsbury which would I guess we'd kind of identified as a potential banana skin Um, but it didn't pan out that way at all did it uh, I mean, a, a, a funny game in some ways, but um, but one that was overall very satisfying as we left. Uh, Paul, why don't we start off with your moment of the week? Um, yeah, it, well, I will, I'll go for the third goal just because it's always nice to see a player emphatically smash the ball into the roof of the net, isn't it? And so I think he he deserved his second goal for a, a really good all-round performance and it was a shame so quickly when you hear the round you go yeah I thought Armstrong was going to take the penalty you were like yeah it's a bit of a shame that he didn't get the chance to to get the match ball but no it was quite nice to see Armstrong put a couple of sort of not great performances behind him with an absolute superstar performance and it's just a massive shame that we're obviously not going to have him next week yeah and on and tomorrow in fact I think yeah I I I can't quite get it why? So they're saying it's because it's a youth loan. That's technically why we're not allowed to have the best player. I, I think he's been called up, hasn't he? So I but, think the the Yeovil miss is for the same reason as the Fleetwood miss. Is that or is that not true? Yeah, well, it is, isn't well, it? It's just. But haven't we lost other players as well? Yeah. So, well, but cause, again, because because they've been called up to so the the England youth squad. So Bryn Morris and Ryan Kent are both gone. What I did like on the post match analysis on the taking my Clive Eakin on Saturday was he was talking about um, top goal scorers and when they'd scored their goals and the fact that Armstrong had scored his goals in the league because Newcastle <laughs> wouldn't let him play. My favourite bit was the fact that, that they were bemoaning the fact he hadn't scored in the match tomorrow night. So they were bemoaning the fact he, he hadn't scored in a game that hadn't taken place in which he couldn't play. <laughs> <laughs> but that seemed, didn't seem to phase them. What phased them was the fact he hadn't scored in it. It was yeah. very strange. I mean, uh, with his goal rate as it is at the moment, you can understand expectations being high. That seems a touch too far, I would suggest. Um, yeah. Neil, did you have a, a favourite of the three goals that we scored on? Imagine being so uh, so fortunate as to one score three goals and then secondly you pick a favourite. I know. I know. I'm... It's a crazy thing. <laughs> did you have a favourite out of the three? Fortunately, think penalty. I... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did like that penalty, but... Um... I didn't like him taking it, but we'll, we'll get onto that a bit later. I think I'm going to go with so much Paul, actually. That that third goal, because I think it, the way it started with Reader Johnson absolutely slamming into that tackle, it sort of built up to this crescendo, and then the finish was just insanely sort of emphatic. And it just rounded off a performance, because 2-0 is, yeah, OK, 2-0, you've won. But 3-0 always looks, there you go, you've won, you've dominated, you've, you've run really well. And um, yeah, so, yeah, his goal... It's really great goal and good ball through to him and great finish. I think you would have to go back some years to find a season where we had scored two, uh, three or more in a game twice by this stage of the season. I mean, most seasons we're fortunate if we've scored more three or more in a game once or twice a season. So I think, yeah, yeah I'm completely with you. There is a certain frisson of excitement that comes about when a third goes in. And especially given how profligate we were during the game, it was, a, it was very exciting, wasn't it? Definitely. Um, well, when was the last time we scored what we won 3-0 at home at the Rico? It must be must be a long time ago. I mean, I under, would, under Robbins or I would even poss- before that? I would possibly 
suggest the Alzi Town um, oh God. FA Cup game. Although I don't know if that what counts. A feeling. Yeah. yeah, bearing in mind that that was, you know, Postman and, and San Marino players. Um, I'm going to go for, um, uh, and this you can probably just patch in a previous recording of this and indeed a future recording. I'm going for Reed Johnson again. Um, I like that. No, that's good. I'm going firstly for what was the consummate maniac performance uh, on the pitch on Saturday <laughs> afternoon of just, and hopefully we'll talk about this as the, as the pod goes on, but just, I don't, I'm not sure that players know how to deal with him or that referees know how to deal with him at all. And I don't think he knows what's going on, but he's just a joy to watch. He's even more of a joy to watch, I would suggest, when he's tweeting short videos of himself in his hot tub yeah. after the game. <laughs> he's loving technology at the moment, isn't he? He's, he's all there with the videos. It's it's just a curious, curious thing, isn't it? But it's we've we've talked about the good feeling at the club and and the players, and also actually, I, I'll, I'll give a special mention to um, radio Col- radio control car Reese Charles Cook. Um, big, big, <laughs> Because he's, yeah, I, I keep seeing his name written down in initials and I just keep thinking radio control car, sorry. Um, but the, he looked absolutely delighted to have made his home debut. And that was really, really, um, I thought that was really, really nice. I think you can come almost desensitised to football and think that football is a sort of prima donnas or the, but it was really uh, clear that it really was quite special for him. And I thought that was really fantastic. And I thought he had a, a good game as well. Um, I think it was fair to say that most people had a good day at the office, albeit with some sort of ins and outs from one or two. Is that a fair assessment, Neil? How about uh, who really stuck out for you was playing well? I think Paul's already mentioned it. Armstrong, I thought was that second half especially was an absolute class above. And it, it's kind of, it almost reminded me of the Wigan game where he'd, he'd got the goals then as well. And something about his confidence once he realises just how good he is compared to the players around him. And he's just got such a gorgeous sort of pivot on, on the ball where he can just turn at, on a six months. It's, it's fantastic. And he sort of sort of epitomised our attack really. It was, I, I just felt it was easy on Saturday. And that, that's kind of why we played the way we did. And I've seen sort of different elements of assessment about what, how we played and why we, we played the way we did. But I, I just felt it was, it became that easy in the second half that the, the, the attackers just thought, well, we, we get, we're going to get the ball. We're going to be able to attack. We'll just stick it out. We'll, we'll hang around in the attack. And there were so many moments where there was just like a cluster of our attacking players all within like 20 yards of each other. And they were just, hanging around just like waiting to get the ball again so that they could take on the defence and it it was just one of those games where as it wore on we felt more and more comfortable and like you say I mean we, we were pretty wasteful again at home and we should have scored it could have been 10 and I'm not don't even exaggerate the amount of times we got into a position where we should have been finishing but three three will do for now and you know it was <laughs> it was a you know we'll get four next game but it was just one of those games where it, it just I was absolutely comfortable throughout. And so basically we just sort of had two, a defensive unit and attacking unit, both doing their jobs and not really worrying about the rest of it. And it was just, like I say, a really comfortable performance. Um, I, I was a little bit worried when we first heard the team. I mean, Fortuna came into the starting lineup and up to this point, it, it's we've kind of been... They were critical of him, and but I think what it showed on Saturday was that maybe we've been critical of uh, an unfit or a, a not match fit Fortune because he he struck me as a really useful link up player, and he, he started to show himself as a, a a very good player at this level as well. I mean, I, I was a little bit worried because Jim O'Brien, in my mind, even though he's not been playing very well recently, has some sort of intensity about him which sort of rubs off across the team and I, I like that and in our attacking play it kind of it rubs off on everybody and we, we play quite nicely when he's there even if he's not playing well but this unit worked as well so um, Fortuna came in he, he linked up strongly he brought Armstrong in who, who was playing deeper than uh, I assumed he'd play up front by himself but no he played deeper and that actually worked really well as well because Armstrong's so good at sort of carrying the ball and um getting into really good positions just beyond the striker. So 
Talk to us a well, little bit more about that dynamic, because that was something that I guess will have been an eye opener for many. And I certainly was of the opinion that Armstrong would be best suited playing off the shoulder. Uh, and I guess, well, I found, I found it slightly contentious, the idea that he was playing as a number 10 in inverted commas, but there was no doubt over the fact that he was in a slightly more withdrawn role. Are you able to sort of explain the dynamic between him and Fortune a little bit more? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm never too sure how sort of purposeful this sort of stuff is. I mean, if I was Armstrong, I know I'd be just dropping deep, trying to pick up the ball because it was kind of like, he wanted to get in the ball. He knew he was better than the players around him and he was just confident. And I mean, in the second half, especially that's how it appeared. But I guess in the first half, it was, it was almost your stereotypical big man, small man sort of dynamic because Fortune was so, so good at holding the ball up and just getting his back in. And when you've got someone like Jermaine Granderson, who by the way has filled out ever such a lot. It's quite, a, <laughs> yeah. he, he's a sturdy unit now, that man. Um, and yeah, so I, it was hard for him in the air, but when he got his back in, it was it was absolutely fine, and he was just rolling the ball off to either Kent or you know Armstrong, and it it worked, and it just amazes me really when we, we you keep saying sort of this redundancy of attacking formation, and it's kind of it's so true because it's it's almost about the individuals and how they're playing, and we could have maybe five different dynamics going on up front, and they've all got their own positives and they've all got their own cons, but. In my mind, I really love the idea of having this four-two-four formation. That that's the ultimate. So when he came in, Fortuna, I thought oh, we can't play in the same way. But we played in a fluid way, but just in a different way. That's rubbish analysis. But it's no, no, just- no. I think, but you, you're absolutely right, and I think it's very difficult to quantify. But what you're saying, I think, the thing of of the attack sort of being meaningless when it comes to the numbers you could call it 4231 you could call it 424 you can call it what you want effectively but those players roughly occupied two wide very advanced wide players and two strikers i didn't yeah. i didn't see armstrong as playing in a number 10 in the sense of paul on the way home described uh, referenced francesco totti which i think is sort of quintessential number 10 mm. and uh, there were he wasn't dropping deep and looking for the ball very deep or anything. To me, there was just two strikers on the pitch. And it was interesting that that, that all the talk was of Armstrong playing in a withdrawn role. And I accept that some of the stuff that he did was in a withdrawn role. But both of the goals came from from Fortune being behind him and playing him in. So at what point do you decide that someone is an advanced striker or a deep line? I think it's just two strikers. Like you say, I, I think it's almost... But it's and we I, obviously we're contributing to it by not analysing it now. But the, I think we do get so hung up on the idea of where everyone's playing. It, I thought they were two strikers that played well together. That's no, well, no. Now I sort of think about it. Sorry, Paul, you carry on. But it's a bit more complicated than that, though, isn't it? Because basically, the idea is Fortune would play higher at the pitch than, than Armstrong, basically because Fortune then occupies the defenders, and it, I mean. Everyone knows I've been slightly critical, and I'm not going to apologise for the fact that I have been critical of some of his performances in the past. Go on. Because they were <laughs> substantial. No, I mean, I mean, we're not going to come up with hindsight and go, I'm going to go back to the Chesterfield game and say he was good. He was shit against Chesterfield. <laughs> he was very good on Saturday. And I think you've got to judge it on a game-by-game basis. And I still stand by what I said after the Chesterfield game, and I thought he had a really good game on Saturday. He did everything you'd want from that type of player, and he did all the basics as well as you'd want. He didn't do anything particularly complicated, which is kudos to him because I think sometimes you can get overexcited with, in the same way Marcus Tugguy did in the first half against Rochdale away, where he saw these young whippersnappers playing this sort of one-touch football and thought, I can do that too. (laughs) You can't. But what you can do is you can be someone who plays with their back to goal, who can be stronger, who can hold the ball up and pick the right pass and, you know, Mark Fortuna both, you know, he set up two and scored one. You can't argue with that. And he had a good game. But what they try to do is Fortuna goes up against the defender and, as you say, basically outmuscles them or is someone you can hit the ball to and stands there back to goal, brings others into play. And the thing with Armstrong dropping slightly deeper is he's not on a one on one battle with the centre half. Both of his goals, he didn't. In a way, he, he did beat a player, but he didn't. He didn't beat the man who was marking him. He ran into space 
And then the nearest player to him had to come and try and tackle him. And that's a different type of battle. And it's very difficult, as we know, when you play against a team where their main striker is, is basically not being marked. He's in the free space. And in sort of what Joe was saying when we were discussing it on Saturday, he basically played as a deep lying, deep lying number nine. He didn't play in a number 10 in the way that Madison or Kent plays. He played as a striker, just slightly withdrawn, which meant when he went forward, because of the way that Fortuna is playing in front of him, he could go right or left into that space. So neither centre-back knew who was going to mark Armstrong at any one time. And that's, you know, when you're a centre-half, what you want to know is who you're marking. And it's very difficult when you've got someone of that two different strikers play very different ways. You don't know, and you don't know uh, minute by minute which one of those you're going to mark. I, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with all of that. I don't like the idea that we've got a deep lying number nine to add to a false nine, a deep lying forward, uh, Raum Deuter. If you're a football manager, but I, like I say, I think, and I know that I asked, the, I, I know I asked the question about the dynamic of it, and so I, I well, yeah, but the I, I do, I do think that. I do think people can get a bit ahead of themselves as uh, really, I mean, hilariously, we've probably talked about this for about five minutes now, about the insistence on placing some sort of wild, flowery description of what a striker mm. or an attacker is. Whereas actually, and I guess it's helpful if they're good when it makes it a little bit easier, maybe they're just sort of attacking. <laughs> that's exactly what I was saying. It's like it kind of that front four. By the end of it, that's what they were doing. They were just all like hanging around, just like attacking and sort of waiting for them to get the ball so they could atta- attack again. Because in the past, we've had like attacking players who have never looked threatening. They they get the ball and we we move forward, and you just don't feel like they're, they're going to be able to craft any sort of chance. Saturday, every single time a player got the ball, the only goal was. All right, let's try and create a chance. And more often than not, they were doing something with it. And it was just, it's, it's amazing to see the transformation from what we've been so used to at the Rico to now where you're sitting there and every time you attack, you genuinely expect some sort of shot and goal. It's, it's so different. Neil, where, where are you sat at the moment? Sorry, Neil, where are you sat at the moment? I'm in block 22 by the empty stand. Right in the corner. Well, what was your take on the penalties? Well, I'll tell you what, the one that was given, I'd say, was the one that was probably the lesser of all the penalties. I mean, I thought Kent, the problem with Kent is it, he he does go down like one of those small lads who, you know, it looks worse than it probably is. But both of those were penalties, I'd say. I mean, the first one, he got his foot to the ball, he just toe-ended it past it. And it doesn't matter if he's lost control of the ball or not, he was completely taken out. And the ref just, because it was so early on in the game, you could tell he just didn't want to give a penalty. And the second time, again, he, he was just cleaned out. And it was just, the ball, you could tell from the angle of the ball, it, Kent had knocked it out. It was a goal kick or a foul. Ref bottled it again, gave a corner. And it doesn't really matter now. But at the same time, it's just frustrating when you've got a player like that who's so dangerous and he's just... He's not getting his just desserts for good play. You know, he's evaded a defender. He's made the defender make a tackle, and it should have been two penalties. And then March Antoine Fortuna he was, yeah, I'd say probably on the on the basis of everything you see, it probably is a penalty. But it's about a Leon Clarkish kind of penalty. It's sort of like mm, pulled him down a little bit. It's, you don't usually see them, but we got it. Well, because the other one with Kent on the edge of the area wasn't there. Which we from at where we were, we weren't sure if it was inside or outside the area, but the referee didn't give it anyway. And then after that, the discussion around us was: it doesn't matter what happens, the next time there's a challenge in the box, it will be a penalty. And it just yeah, happens and that's, to be that's that. The, I just say that one Fortuna. But yeah, I, and that's, I, I that's the ref for you, I, isn't I it? I don't think Kent helps him. Kent doesn't help himself, does he? In a, in a way, I don't know what you're saying about um, it's good playing. He's sort of drawn the fouls. But because he seems to go down quite easily, quite often, I think referees have already pegged him as someone who's prepared to go to the ground at the slightest of touch. What did you think of Kent's overall performance? I, th- I think he's a confident player. and he, he. I don't think he was as sort of impactful as he has been, but he was just another one of those who, who just felt like 
he knew he had the better of his players around him. It just wasn't coming off from it. It was almost like Murphy's performance where Murphy, again, he got the ball, enough of the ball, but, but it just wasn't really coming off from him at that final stage. And they just, but they both knew that they had the better of the, the, their defender. And that's why we were so sort of good attacking wise, because they, they kept getting the ball and they kept attempting these things. And sometimes it would come off, sometimes it wouldn't, but I'd certainly like persist with Kent. I think there's, there's something in there. I, I, I also think he should have scored. That one where he was through on goal, I mean, the options were plenty. He could have, you know, slotted it round the keeper. He could have taken it round, the, round him, but instead he just put it straight into the keeper's legs. It's kind of, that's youth maybe. That's maybe um, the, the occasion of scoring his first league goal and um, getting the better of him. But um, no, I, I thought overall he gave, for, for his age and for, you know, who he is and he's still learning, he gave another, you know, really sort of um, good performance. What about Murphy? You touched on Murphy there. You touched on the chances that Kent missed. There was two, I think, that Murphy missed that I felt could have done better. Yeah, but what, yeah the you... first one. Yeah. Yeah, the want... one where he was thrown on goal and he was kind of like... The, 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 their keeper committed himself, himself so early every time and it was almost like just have the nous to lift it above him because he's already on the ground and Murphy just didn't have a good day, really. He, he, Again, he, he's always a threat, so you, you sort of loathe to take him off because he's likely to do something useful. But he just, every footballer has one of those days where, you know, the passes aren't, the margins aren't quite right. He's a yard off. He's he's just um, misjudging things. He's, he's, you know, he's hitting people's legs. And that's that's fair enough. It, it kind of happens. So he, what he needs to do now is not dwell on things like that and just you know, continue on the path of getting the ball and you know, being the good player and, you know, taking people on because... It, it does come into his own in the second half, certainly when um, people start to get tired and he's able to sort of find that space behind their right back. And I, I think it was the right decision to take him off because he was clearly not on his game. But um, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't hold that against him this week. I think a player like that can sometimes blow hot and cold, can't they? I think that's yeah, just that's exactly. just one of the sort of pit. Um, to what extent do you think that the three nil victory was a bit of a flattery in the sense that? Did you think that Shrewsbury brought a great deal to the table or, or do you think that we were worth every penny of it? No, I, I probably sort of suggested this already, but yeah, I think we were, I just felt it was easy. It, it was easy in the sense that for, as, a, as a defensive unit against our four attackers, they couldn't really deal with it. And it was only our lack of clinical finishing as always um, that was stopping them from losing by far more. I mean, they were, uh, Granderson looks okay, you know, he's a sturdy player and he, he sort of had the measure of reader from corners and things like that. And th- even Liam Lawrence, again, he was in midfield. He he, he certainly looked a, a good quality player for them in this league. But I just felt they, they couldn't handle our movement. They couldn't handle our pace, our sort of, sort of ingenuity in attack. They couldn't handle any of that. And it was just, it was an easy game. And that's kind of where the whole sort of split between attack and defence came from, just because... We had players playing up front who just wanted to get the ball and attack. And that's not to say they didn't defend, but it just it wasn't as necessary this week for them to keep a rigid formation because we were actually causing them far more trouble by just keeping those four players up. They had to worry about that all the time. And as you sort of move back through the team, you had obviously Fleck and Vince like doing what they normally do. I mean, you'd expect Fleck to move forward a little bit more. And actually, his shot as well. I would have loved that to have gone in because that was, that was awesome. And I'm glad he's getting in those positions again because... We always talk about John Fleck and his technique and what a great strike of the ball he's got, but he really has and he needs to get around those positions more often because in the past he's been wild with his shooting, but this season so far he's just shown a, a much better sort of level of it because consistency and technique and get him around the box, let him have a few shots. I'm sure he's going to get a few more goals this year. And then when you look at the defence, it was just a, a nice sturdy line of four. I think sustainability-wise, you can't really call that in football, but... I would still prefer Reader and uh, Ricketts as my middle two. I think as for the, the course of the season, I prefer that. But that's not to say Martin didn't do a good job. I think you know he's coming to the team. He's he was a little bit rusty to start with, but happy to con- sort of persist with his back four for the time being because it's, it seems to be working. They're starting to get a little bit of um, you know they're starting to gel a little bit. So yeah, carry on with that. Do you think Aaron Martin on that subject has turned a number of people around? Because I think that of the existing squad, 
he was one that came in for a significant amount of criticism. Do you think he's done enough in the last few games to turn some of that round? I, I thought he was quite good on Saturday. Again, Yeah, I think the good thing about Aaron Martin is now he's not being relied upon as the person to lead the attack from defence almost. So in the past, we've had people like Jordan Clark, who's the, the, the point who's supposed to be you know, sort of moving it on, he's starting attack from defence. Aaron Martin can't do that. He's not that sort of player. You see the amount of time he smashes the ball out of play. That's what he likes to do. Fine, do that. Aaron Martin now is that he's just giving it to other people to let. You know, really, Johnson's much more comfortable moving out from defence. So is Ricketts. He's able to move it on to Vincent and we can build from that point onwards. We're not having to worry about Aaron Martin being out, dwelling on the ball like he used to do. And that's, that's good because all I want Aaron Martin to do is defend. I want him to win the headers. I want him to get his foot in. I want him to be positionally correct. And when he does get the ball, roll off to Vince Lott, roll off to. Um, Ricketts, and that's what he did. And that's what makes a good performance for Aaron Martin. There's no point trying to turn him into something that he's not. I, I just don't think his distribution's up to standard. But if we don't need him to be up to standard, if we can just give it off to someone else, that's absolutely fine. And that's what he did. I agree with you. I think he's another interesting example of the difference that it makes having competent players around you in terms mm. of how it makes you look as a player. A player that I think, uh, rightly at times, was was vilified last season. But as with Fleck, uh, and as even with Tudguy for it to a certain extent, uh, a player who this season you look at and go, it's entirely possible that being surrounded by crap players made you look a lot worse yeah. than you actually yeah. were. <laughs> they, they, they happen to do more than they're, they're supposed to be doing. I mean, every player's got like their own tendencies and their own things that they're good at. Fleck was starting to get a feel for the kind of player that he, he is and what he's supposed to be. And all through last season, he was having to do about three different jobs. And that's just, it's not fair on him almost because it does, like you say, make him look like a worse player than he is. Give him the freedom to, to play his role as he should be and, he looks a good player. Tud guy, let him be the player he should be. He looks good. And same goes for Martin. And I think that's, like you say, so people like Vince Light is such a crucial element of that team as well because he picks up he picks up about three different elements that other players were having to pick up last year. And he's just so competent at what he does. And again, he was not noticeable on, on Saturday, but as long as he's not noticeable and as long as he's just getting the ball and doing what he needs to do with it, I'm really happy with him. I think he's, potentially the signing of the season so far sometimes with a particularly traumatic event um the the sort of the full weight of it doesn't really become clear until later down the line and i think i've only just really been hit with the full gravity of the situation where last season flex defensive cover like his sort of bodyguard in midfield was adam barton wow <laughs> Can you conceive of that for just a second? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing, because you all know I didn't mind Adam Barton, but no, absolutely when, not. You, when you reflect on it now, you sort of think, <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> what is Adam Barton having to defend? He's even worse than having, like, maybe you could put Madison in that position, you'd probably do a better job. It's just, but, oh, I, but as you say, I'm reflecting on it now, and I'm thinking of times where we would have done podcasts where we'd have said, you know, I think maybe we should persevere with Adam Barton playing as like an enforcer to allow Fleck the creativity. Or even worse, potentially we were using Fleck as the <laughs> as the enforcing defensive midfielder. Um, Remember when Adam Barton was a striker? That was good, wasn't it? There was a, on the subject of, of Fleck's uh, inability to be a defensive midfielder. Did anybody else see the moment in the first half where he leapt a tackle so high that he could have caught the ceiling stanchion and may as well have waved a white flag as he was going it was uh it was a show of cards i would suggest in early, <laughs> at an early part of a football match that you would have maybe reconsidered given the option it made him look somewhat lightweight obviously it didn't matter at the end but when it happened i was like oh mate come on <laughs> at, least, at least pretend that you're not really scared all the time you delicate genius <laughs> Right, have we got any final thoughts on the uh, on the Shrewsbury game or should we move on to uh, to the game that everyone is waiting just, for? I just wanted to shout out to Reese Charles Cook, who I thought, first league game, all told, really, really solid. I mean, he had like Velcro hands. Was, the yeah. way he claimed all the balls, it was fantastic. I can only think of a couple of occasions where he maybe made small mistakes obviously the the kick his first kick um, he was a little bit ponderous on it but we'll forgive him that it's his first game and then he parried one where we probably could have caught straight off but other than that I just I was really pleased I mean it's nice to know that you, you do have someone like him who could come in and he had all the attributes of a good keeper 
Yeah, distribution especially, I thought, was... Um, oh, so quick as well. Very, very off. quick, very astute. Um, yeah, good to see. We're really delighted to see that we've got two young, talented keepers, haven't we? I know that everyone... A little bit worried that he's going to do sort of like rainbow flicks and stuff when the ball comes to his feet, but um, there was a... hopefully he'll be able to curb there was like the briefest glimpses of you could almost see it in his mind at times, couldn't you? But but he managed. <laughs> Shall to, I try it? Yeah. yeah. Um, just I mean, get him to ask out a Boruch How does that does for you every so often? <laughs> see whether he'd recommend it. Okay, then uh, only Kavet. Who would like question one? Who would like question two? I'll take question one. All right, question one. Keith O'Neill. This is the link, right? Yeah, what links these four things? I, I'm going to go, bearing in mind how lucky I got last time, I'm going to say Irish players. No. All right. Gavin Ward. Keith O'Neill, Gavin Ward. Yeah. Uh, no, go on. Mick Quinn. Oh, no, go on. Andy Williams. What a selection. Andy Williams, the Bristol City player or someone that played for us way back before I can realise and remember? Yeah, the latter. Um, no, go on. But Neil? Neil? Can you just read through him again, please? Just give me a bit. Right. Keith O'Neill, mm-hmm. Gavin Ward, Mick Quinn and Andy Williams. All own racehorses? Nope. They've all got sim- same names as musicians. So mm-hmm. Keith O'Neill is the drummer of the of Cast. <laughs> Gavin Ward is the guitarist with Bolt Thrower. Mick Quinn is the bassist with Supergrass. And Andy Williams is the singer Andy Williams. Andy Williams of course, These yeah. questions are getting better and yet more impossible by the same measure. It's, it's, that's a fantastic question. I mean, how, I, I, I'm, and I, you know, have reasonable music knowledge. I wouldn't know what the name of Cast's drummer was. What was the second one? Bolt thrower. Bolt thrower. Have you made that up in the hope that we <laughs> wouldn't notice? <laughs> no, I, I, that's why I left Andy Williams last. Cause I thought you go, oh, Andy Williams. He's I like the singer, and then sort of take it from there. Obviously not. <laughs> it, it did take me a long time to find a bassist with the same name as a cov player. Obviously, because it got me to Mick Quinn. So I had to go through all the letters of the alphabet until I got to Q. How did you even go about... Sorry, to this might be a bit of a tangent. How on earth did you get these answers? All right. On um, Wikipedia, if you're writing Coventry City football players, there's a list of everyone who's played for Coventry City alphabetical order. If you go into Wikipedia and write in names of bassists, there's an alphabetical list of bassists or any other... How long did this got... take you? <laughs> well, the thing is, the other thing, if you, go, if you go on the list of players, like it will say... Yeah, dis- dis- um, disambiguation, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was a case of, oh, Keith O'Neill brackets, what else does a Keith O'Neill do? Oh, isn't a Keith O'Neill... Oh, he's the, he's the uh, drummer with cast. Oh, okay, I'll go on that, I'll go on that. So that's, yeah, that's where that question came from. That took me about 20 minutes at work. That's how productive I was at, at lunchtime. <laughs> I'll say lunchtime just in case. Yeah, just to be on the safe side, yeah. All right, uh, Neil. Yes. What links these four things? Chelsea, okay. 2012. Um, give me the next one, but I think I know. Chelsea, 2013. Okay, I don't know. Can I have a third one, please? <laughs> Liverpool, 2005. Oh, this is non cob related, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Um, go on, I'll have, I'll have the fourth. Chelsea, 1998. Right, can you run through them one more time and then I'll give you a guess. Okay. Chelsea, 2012. Chelsea, 2013. Liverpool 2005, Chelsea 1998. I lied. I'm not going to have a guess because I can't think of anything. Sorry. Joey? Is it the last four teams to have won the FA Cup and the League Cup without winning the league? No. What it is, is the last... So there's four, or there have been four major European trophies. So Chelsea won... Chelsea were the last... 
English holders of the Champions League stroke European Cup yeah. in 2012. Uh, Chelsea in 2013 with the last Europa, team to it hold yeah, Europa or UEFA. Yeah. Liverpool 2005 won the Super Cup. And yeah. Chelsea in 1998 yeah. with the last English team to Cup winners. Ah. That's a good question. They should have stuck with the Cup Winners Cup. Yeah, they probably should. They probably shouldn't have got gone with the Europa League. There you go. Um, okay, so mm, Joey, no Neil, you've got question one or two in the second round. I have two, please, Bob. All right, Coventry City. So what comes so, fourth in this list? All right, okay. Um, Accrington Stanley. No, Celtic. Ipswich. No. Ancona. Um, the Coventry, Celtic, Ancona. West Brom? No. Joey? No, it'll be the career trajectory of someone, but I can't quite place it. Okay, if I give the, the final answer is Chelsea... Do you know who that player is? And is that the route that they went? They went from Coventry to Celtic, Celtic to Ancona to on Chelsea? Loan to, on loan to Ancona and then went to Chelsea, but they never actually played for Chelsea. Uh, if it wasn't the pressure of the podcast, I reckon I could get this. But. Yeah, over the course of half an hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, I'd work it out. Um, Ancona. No, I'm going to pass it. Oh, hang on a second. No, 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 go on. No, no, it's really yeah, good. Magnus Heaven. Oh. God, yeah, Chelsea. Damn it. Good call. Lo- lovely question. Right, last one. Okay. Um, this is the Diva Stadium, Chester. It's what comes fourth in this list. Yeah. Um, KC Stadium, Hull. Next. St. Mary's, Southampton. No, I'm not going to know that. Neil? Something to do with new stadiums, I think. Um, but I might be well off. Uh, you are. Okay, well, I would say a new stadium then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Kassam Stadium, Hoxford. No. All right, the Diva Stadium is 16 foot above sea level. KC Stadium is six foot above sea level. St. Mary's is three foot above sea level. The lowest altitude football ground in England is Blundell Park, Grimsby, or Cleethorpes, oh. which is two foot above sea level. Do you know what the highest altitude is? Is it West Brom? Yeah, Hawthorns. There we go. The Hawthorns, yeah, it's 500 foot above sea level. I think Mexico City's ground is like 7,000 foot above <laughs> sea level or something ridiculous. For um, all those who like comparisons between two things, context. But yeah, group. Yeah, so basically, if there is a Waterworld esque flood, just hope <laughs> we're not playing uh, Grimsby away in the same week. Well, you notice how only effect has become sort of a knowledge collection exercise rather than us actually knowing anything. Well, I learn lots each week, but I don't think I've ever got a question right this season. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bar the oddly uh, simple their French question, <laughs> yeah. which I reckon at the moment is going to be the only one that I'll get all season. I'm completely with you. I find it fascinating, but the quiz element to it is utterly redundant. <laughs> yeah, we should give that up. It should just be like Paul says, and then it just it gives us some information. Right, should we do some preview then? Go on. Um, right, so we've got Yeovil tomorrow. Uh, and Fleetwood on Saturday. Do, do you know, I've got to be totally honest with you, these are going to be pretty brief previews, mainly because um, I usually have a look at things like form and players who've scored and ex-Cov players and stuff. And I've got to be honest, it's pretty scant for both of them, um, largely because both of them are doing so poorly in their respective divisions that they don't really have anything as luxurious as goal scorers. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so if you can imagine that. Just going to start with Yeovil then. They're 22nd in League 2 at the moment. They've got Paul Sturrock in charge. They've played 11 league games. They've only won two of them. Um, they 
don't have any sort of noticeable deficiency in either attack or defence, uh, other than that they're both worse than most other teams, but they haven't conceded an inordinate amount or scored uh, an incredible paucity. They just just sort of boringly crap by the looks of it. <laughs> um, their keeper is Chris Wheel, who I guess most will remember for playing for Leicester, I'm guessing in the Premier League, but certainly a reasonable standard for a while. Uh, or maybe actually it was while they were in League One. Who knows? But he was an all right player for Leicester for a period. Um, he played 160 times for Yeovil at the start of his career and has gone back there this summer. Um, they've got Ryan Bird, who scored four goals, who is a striker. And they have ex Coventry City superstar Sean Jeffers up front. Um, so I don't know I mean that's literally all I've got I don't know whether we want to do some predictions for this one before we move on to Fleetwood which actually is probably going to be a little bit shorter uh, Neil, predictions now yeah what? Neil why not what, what, have you, what have you got for us we've got this in the bag I reckon yep. um, I was a little bit worried before um, our last League Cup game but now I think we've got a 3-1 victory on the cards nice uh, Paul uh, I'll go 1-0 um, I think I, yeah, I think I quite fancy 3-1 as well. Although saying that, it'll be interesting to see what he does. The good thing, I guess, is that we have got, from being in a situation where at the start of the season we were bemoaning a lack of options, mm. I, I counted up something like eight or nine attacking players that we've got um, available to us at the moment. So whilst we'll be missing Armstrong et al., um, we do have people like Lemiris to come in and, and to go, etc., it's just going to be a case of how quickly they settle down for what will be quite a significant change. But there you go. Um, so I'm going to go for 3-1. Then on Saturday, we have Fleetwood. Uh, and I hadn't really noticed this. I knew that they weren't doing particularly well, but I didn't realise that they dropped as low as 23rd in League One so far this season. They've scored 14, which is extraordinarily high for a team that are 23rd. To put that into perspective, teams that have scored 14th go as high up as 8th. Port Vale have scored 14. In fact, Burton, who are uh, top looking at this, have only scored 13. Oh dear. How many have they let in? Uh, Burton have only conceded 7. Um, and actually, that reminds me, there's those really good... He's called Ben Mayhew, which is at Experimental361 on Twitter. Yes, yeah. Um, that puts into perspective some of the stuff that we saw on there. For once, his excellent, excellent graphics. Really, really recommend them to uh, anybody out there. He does graphics that indicate the performance of teams in the respective leagues. The defence ones for Burton and Walsall were astonishing. And looking at it, it's because they've only conceded seven and six goals respectively. But, uh, but going back to Fleetwood, clearly 14 goals shows a level of potency in there. They've conceded 19, which is about the worst in the division, in the division but not mm. the worst. And actually in reasonable keeping with some of the other teams. So you would guess, reading into that, that they haven't been spanked all over the place at any point, but they just keep losing by the looks of it. Yeah, yeah. They are currently without a manager. Um, there is a gentleman, um, a handsome gentleman, who is one to ten on favourite for the position. Any idea? Stephen. Going to start working with Scotland's under seventeens. Prezels, yeah. So, so that is true. Then I said that on Saturday, and I was boohooed. I don't think you can be. Um, I don't think you can be boohooed, can you? But you know what I mean. <laughs> um, um, I, th- I, th- I thought I read that earlier today. Yeah, no, that's what I said, but I was told uh, categorically that he wasn't. Okay, um, he's worth another go. I think. I think we're we were we're a bit harsh on him. Do, do you know what's going to be interesting with him if he does get that job, which it looks very likely that he will? Um, he is jumping from the complete opposite situation to what we had. So we are, in theory, and people can contest this if they desire, but but they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> it, we are a big club of you know if you look at stadium population etc etc who had no money at the time who were just absolutely you know horrible uh, he's moving to Fleetwood who are give or take must be the smallest club in the league yeah um, but the a reasonably well to do aren't they so it's going to be interesting because I would say that his deficiencies as a manager for us were his ability to recruit and I don't know whether that would be uh, made better or worse by having a few quid in his pocket. You don't know whether he might sort of... Well, yeah, I guess that's that. But a, a man that I admire res- uh, quite a lot. It would be also be interesting, the fact that supposedly he roomed with Graham Alexander when they were playing for Scotland together, and now he will be replacing him in his job. 
That's why oh, they look that, so alike. That's a bold statement because you got to remember that Brendan Rodgers is out there looking for a job, and you know, Dick Advocate <laughs> might want one more job before he finally <laughs> called it a day. So Klopp might have his head turned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Banter, banter. Um, that's not banter. It's just <laughs> yeah. Um, but just on side subject, very quick one. Klopp, would you touch Liverpool with a barge pole? I I, I would. But I think that his, I think his reputation is an interesting one anyway because he did an absolutely magnificent job with Dortmund for five years that tailed off a little bit uh, towards the end. But that is his CV by and large, isn't it? I, I, well, has he got I some experience at, at Mainz, maybe? But I don't. But but I this did. is but this is ultimately. I feel like he, wherever he goes, he can prove that he's a good manager or not. And that realistically, if he is, the scale of the job at Liverpool actually maybe isn't as much as some people see it as being. They have got a very good squad if he can get the best out of them. And it would look like a much superior job than, say, taking the Arsenal job if that was available. But then I don't know. I, I would really hope that it, he does come because he's a barrel of laughs, obviously. The other thing is I don't know whether his style of play would necessarily suit the Premier League or whether they'd just get picked off. But there you go. Neil, thoughts? I don't believe in managers. So um, just, <laughs> <laughs> he could come and it might work out. And it might, I mean, Jose Mourinho is potentially the best manager in the world and he's fucking up at the moment. So you don't know. He could come in and it will probably come... It will look good for a while, and then because of Liverpool being Liverpool, there's some sort of inherent inability to win the league at the moment, and you know it will all go wrong for him. So that's what they've got to look forward to. He did in in the the interesting thing, I guess, with with his place at Liverpool is that the one thing that typified a, a, maybe above anything else his time at Borussia Dortmund was the way that players principal players were sold off underneath him and his ability to quickly regel that team admittedly mm. up until the point where it fell apart in the last season you don't know whether there's an element of that in mind when you go to him to think that actually if he comes in and Coutinho has an incredible tail end of season they can still sell him in the hope that he can find a gem somewhere out there and get them to gel quickly in or I mean this is needlessly long talking about Klopp and Liverpool I've just realised <laughs> yeah, I'd, like I'd just like to add two final points since I asked the original question one I think his final season at Dortmund has got to be put in the concept that he lost quite a few players to injury and quite a lot of his players have played with Germany to the World Cup final and I think there were you see that quite a lot with players getting fatigued whether or not with a starty play he had, that didn't help. The other thing is, can you imagine how, I mean, we still hark on back to like 1987. We've won one trophy in our history and had a brief spell in the 1970s under Jimmy Hill. Can you imagine a team like Liverpool where you've got five European Cups, 19, or 18 league titles, and number of FA Cups? It's just, that's got to be a millstone around your neck. And it was a massive millstone around my United's neck until... Sir Alex came in and basically just managed to, through sort of self-confidence as much as anything else, managed to override it. And we all know that he was very close to being sacked. It's just that pressure at Liverpool to win titles in in a way that, you know, they are so far behind clubs like Man City, Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United, in, in terms of what they can spend on individual players and the wage bill they can use. It's just... I, you feel like that is almost a, a no-win situation. Whoever goes into Liverpool, you're always going to end up probably being fired, especially the way they run at the moment with the Fenway group. It's, if I was caught, I just wouldn't touch that. I think I'd wait for a better job to come along, which has got a lot, lot less hassle associated with it. With all that in mind then, uh, predictions for the Fleetwood game? <laughs> Lovely segue. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Paul, thoughts? Um... Uh, Without Armstrong, I do slightly... Con- I know we other players missed chances against um, Shrewsbury, but Armstrong, is, or he must got, he's got half our league goals this season. Yeah, roughly speaking. Or maybe exactly, yeah. Yeah, it is... I don't know. It's, I, I'm going to go with a 1-0 victory again and just... I just I have no concept of how 
Fleetwood are going to approach it. Neil? I might go along with that, actually. I just think away in the league isn't something that we've done very well recently. So I think we can still get a, a win, but I just don't think we're, we're quite as emphatic at the moment. So 1-0, yeah. I, I feel like a one all draw. But that would still represent an upturn in what has been a recent trend of, of losing away games. I, I, I actually, depending on how we play, I don't think I'd be that gutted about that, despite how... But yeah, I mean, the, 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 the hope is that we'll win, certainly, but, but we do never know. Rightio, I think that's us done. If you want to get in touch with us, the email address is neilamptyshow at gmail.com or it's on Twitter at neilamptyshow. Thanks again for those of you that have voted. Uh, and again, without wanting to repeat myself, although that's what this is, you can still vote for us to actually win the damn thing, which we are pretty um, pretty psyched about. Uh, get to the Twitter, go to footballbloggingawards.co.uk and you can find details for that. Also vote for Matty Roper, who is another young cov blogger, who uh, young cov blogger makes it sound creepy. The reason that it's young cov blogger is because he's nominated in the young blogger section. I feel like I've incriminated myself further. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably best now that I say goodbye to Neil and Paul. Goodbye. Cheers, mate. And goodbye to you, listener. Bye. <laughs>